Okay, I guess I have to apologize because uh, I didn't actually show how I stripped down the piano. Uh, this was, uh, and still is, an upright piano. Uh, like I said, I didn't show you how I strip it down. I mean, so far I've only taken the keys off it, uh, the front face, the top lid, uh, the front panel, and the foot pedals. Uh, there's still a whole lot more material here to be recycled off of this. Um, uh, when I'm finished, it'll most likely end up looking about like this one here. Uh, so what I do, I've got full sheets here, uh, three quarter inch birch veneer ply, uh, good two sides. And uh, instead of trying to run full sheets through the table saw, my table saw doesn't have the biggest bed on it in the world. So to try to uh, put full sheets through can be a bit difficult. And I certainly don't want to get a wiggle halfway through my cut. So what I do is I cut my pieces down slightly oversized and then I'll fine tune them to exact size on the table saw. So that's what I'm doing right now. Right now I'm dry fitting the carcass. Uh, once I get that uh, all dry fit and I'm happy with it, I'll take the clamps off it, glue it, screw it, reclamp it again, and then I'm going to start working on the recessed panels in the back. Uh, normally I do, you know, this is, as I say, good two side, burst near ply, three quarter inch. Normally I do the uh, recessed panels in the back also with uh, three quarter inch ply and uh, the actual panels, a quarter inch uh, burst near ply. But uh, in this, on this particular piano shelf, I'm going to be using uh, solid wood. Uh, just a little extra, little bonus for the customer. It's a bit of a special customer to me, repeat customer. I value his business very much. Uh, thanks, Alan. And uh, so going a little over the top on this one, doing a little, few extra little things that uh, normally I don't do. I mean, none of them are you know, out of this world, but a couple of little extra touches here and there uh, are usually appreciated by my customers. So. Uh, doing a couple of things different than I normally do. Alright, so I got the part of the carcass assembled already. So uh, I clamp in these 90 degree, I know these are true 90 degree uh, blocks. So I clamp those in the corners just to maintain the, the shape uh, until I get the final piece put in. Now the next piece to put in is this curved piece that I put on the forms. Uh, and I have that right here. So. To put this piece in is a bit tricky uh, uh, to get it positioned, so I gotta utilize a bunch of clamps and some rather unorthodox methods. But uh, I'll get this put in here and uh, I'll get it marked up as to where I'm going to be cutting it. And then once I do that, then I take it over to the chop saw and uh, cut it. And uh, I'll tell you what, trying to cut this alone on the chop saw is very difficult. I end up, because uh, obviously you can't just lay it on the bed, it sticks up like this. So I put it on the bed, I jam wedges in and everything else just to try to hold it steady so I can cut it. And uh, so it's a one time shot. You don't want to get a second chance. You cut on that line, it better not move on you. So uh, it's a, a very interesting look contraption uh, on the table, on the chop saw, once I have it all wedged in there and clamped in place to try to hold it steady for that cut. So uh, probably one of the most critical things uh, on this entire build. So I'm going to do that right now. First, like I say, I'm going to size it, uh, position it to where I'm happy with it, mark it out, and then get it to the chop saw and cut it.
All right, it looks perfect. Uh, everything's set up. I've got this piece secured to the table so that it's not gonna move on me. Uh, I mentioned earlier it's a one-time shot, you know, one chance at cutting this. I actually don't, I do have a couple of chances because the curve is longer than what I actually need. However, uh, I'd like to get it done in one shot, not have to recut. It's also a safety issue. When you're dealing with pieces like this that are unstable, they don't lay flat, uh, you certainly don't want that moving in the middle of a cut. I mean, who knows what that could happen. It could kick back at you, it could drag your hand into the blade, a lot of different things. So you really want to make sure you take the time to uh, secure this properly. Hey, if it takes you an extra 15 minutes, it could save you some digits. So uh, in, in my opinion, definitely worth it. So it's all secure. I've got the right angle on the blade. I'm now ready to make the cut. Just making sure I have clearance through the clamps that I have securing the piece. I have clearance for the cut all the way through, start to finish. I hit the dust collector and get this bad boy cut. some nice trim where I trim it out at the end which will cover those. Uh, they're all glued as well. All the corners are glued, screwed and have biscuit joints in them. At the end of the day you have to keep in mind that this is a wall hanging shelf so uh, you never know what a customer is going to put on it. For all I know they can put two cases of wine on it. So uh, I like to overbuild them. This allows me to sleep good at night. Uh, I don't have to worry that oh goodness I hope they don't put too much weight on it. So. They can put on it whatever they can fit on it and I don't have to worry about it. So uh, in the center here I'm using pocket uh, holes or pocket screws. I'll do another two, four, six, another eight into this piece here and uh, a few more pieces to put in and uh, we'll move on to the next step. Uh, Craig jig all set up. Great little thing that Craig jig. Uh, find it a very useful tool. Use it a lot for different projects. Uh, so I'm going to proceed with that now.
All right, so uh, this is my pile right here for the uh, solid wood shelves and the, and the piano shelf. Uh, normally I do them out of uh, three quarter inch plywood and just do a solid wood edging around the four sides of the plywood shelf, but uh, doing a little uh, little treat, a little something extra for uh, this particular customer. Uh, good customer, so I don't mind going uh, the extra mile. Uh, same with the styles and rails in the back of the piano. I also made those solid wood as opposed to uh, uh, the plywood so you know it's a, a bit of extra material a few extra steps uh, you know I cut it to length run it through the jointer so I got two sides uh, flat and one 90 degree corner here so I'll run these through the thickness planer uh, to get three sides good I'll cut the, the fourth side on the table saw and then glue them up uh, for shelves after they're glued up uh, staying in the clamps overnight then I'll uh, run them through the thickness planer once again, then through the drum sander and cut them the finished length, uh, then uh, follow finished sanding, and they should be good to go, oh, along with a routered edge, uh, just to knock off that sharp corner. So uh, I'm gonna start planing these down to uh, about seven eighths of an inch, because I don't wanna go to three quarter right off the bat, I'm gonna take it down to about seven eighths, so that way after the glue up, I take them out of the clamps, I can still have an eighth of an inch that I can plane down off of them to bring them down to my final three quarter inch. So uh, I'm going to get started on that right now. <coughs> So I just finished shooting on and gluing on the uh, solid wood edging on uh, the bottom of the piano shelf. And uh, so right now I'm going to take the time to make sure that any glue that oozed out, uh, I'm going to get it off. Because uh, if you leave any glue residue on the, on the wood at all, when you go to stain it, the stain won't penetrate the glue and it'll look a right mess. Or as my dad says, it'll look like a dog's breakfast. So uh, you don't want a dog's breakfast hanging on your wall, right? So take the time, a uh, little bit of prep work, you know, be prepared for doing this. You don't want the glue to dry and then try to get it off. It's just a nightmare. So, you know, have some uh, wet rags on hands, lots of clean water, warm water works best. And uh, take the time to make sure you get it off because really you go to do a stain job and you've missed some, you're gonna see it instantly and you're really gonna hate yourself. So, uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, let's see, I guess this is the segment of this build where I have a come to Jesus moment and uh, I fess up on something. Uh, the last take that uh, you would have watched in this video was actually done uh, I'd say more than a week ago. A lot of things happened since uh, I did that take. Uh, you see this piano shelf here on the table, and this is what I'm gonna videotape uh, the completion of. Uh, this one here is pretty much at the same stage as the last one you just saw on the table. However, the last one you just saw on the table was actually this one here. So, uh, there's my little confession. some 220 grit uh, it's worth taking the time to double check you don't want to find out in the middle of your staining job you missed a spot so you know really due diligence go over this thing 
with a fine tooth comb and make sure that you've got everything sanded you want sanded. So I've done that and uh, now it needs to be cleaned up, uh, get all the dust off it before I stain and uh, also do a, a relatively good shop cleanup. It's not the fun part, but you can't start a staining project, especially on a piece that, you know, you, you tried hard to, to create a beautiful piece and you don't want to mess it up in the final stage of finishing. And you can do that by getting dust into the finish. It's one of the easiest ways to destroy a piece and uh, have it look terrible. So uh, I'll do a little clean up here, uh, get this cleaned up. And prior to staining, and I'm actually going to treat it with a, uh, <coughs> excuse me, a Minwax product. It's a uh, pre-stain conditioner. And uh, now to touch on this, uh, this plywood here for the carcass is actually maple veneer. Now the original was birch veneer. But uh, when I realized I had to make another one, uh, again, this is one of my favorite clients, so I thought, ah, that's another upgrade I'll do. I'll go from birch veneer to maple veneer, you know, a few more dollars, but again, uh, it looks nice. Plus, I got solid maple on here as well. Uh, and maple, as much as I love it, is a real nightmare when you're staining it, because maple can, can give you a really blotchy finish very easily. And you can't tell whether that piece of wood's gonna give you a blotchy finish or not. And uh, so whenever I'm using maple and a few other woods, but right now we're talking about the maple, I will make sure I use the pre-stain conditioner. Then I'm going to hit it with another Minwax uh, product, which is the uh, Espresso Stain. I really like the tone of that stain. It's a uh, yeah, great color. It looks really rich on these uh, pianos. So I'll do that. And uh, after I do that, then I'll, of course, do the hand rub polyurethane. I'll show you some video. I'm not going to show a video of the staining process. It's just because I have to do it. You know, I gotta go, go, go. There's no time to be pressing buttons on the machine here. So, uh, when you're doing a piece this size, you gotta keep a wet edge. And for those of you that don't know what that means, you know, if you're staining and you stop here and then move the staining in here, when you come back over here, if that bit of stain you put in there is dry, when you start staining and that wet stain now meets that dry stain, you're gonna have a really dark spot there where the wet stain meets dry stain. So that's what it means when I say, you know, you wanna keep a wet edge. And on a piece this size to get the bottoms, the fronts, the sides, the back, uh, and keeping a wet edge, it's it's go time. Uh, I mean, I'm running around here like a, like a cartoon. So uh, I'll get that done. Then I'll show you the, the piano. Then I'll bear thing it. Then after I do the polyurethane, it's actually a hand rub polyurethane, another Minwax product. And uh, uh, I love it. It's a great product. You're normally good with two coats, although I'll probably do three if not four coats on it. Uh, perhaps I'm obsessive compulsive just a little bit. Uh, but once all that's done, then I'll drill the holes for the adjustable shelving. I always do that after. I shouldn't say always. Once I drilled the holes prior to staining and uh, I lived to regret it because then when I was staining and doing the polyurethane, I kept getting drips coming out of those holes. So now I do the whole thing first, then I'll drill it out for the adjustable shelving. Then I'll install the piano keys and the locking hardware and the foot pedals and uh, uh, perhaps uh, another one or two items off the original piano, but not many. There's a lot of pieces in, a, in an upright piano that you go, oh, I can put that on, I can put that on. But you can really turn this from a classy piece into a trashy piece that quick if you start adding too many things. It just you know, looks cheap and you got it. So uh, if you want to watch yourself there, a little composure. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's it. Time to do a shop cleanup and get stained in it, and I'll turn you guys on here when uh, when it's finished being stained. Oh, shop cleanup! I dread the thought. Okay, <laughs> folks, it's uh, not quite 24 hours, about 22 hours since I put the stain on this. It's calmed down quite nicely. Um, and see, as I mentioned, I use the pre-stained wood conditioner on it because of the maple, which is uh, gonna stop it from being blotchy. And uh, actually, if you first saw it when uh, I stained it, immediately after, it looks really blotchy. And you think, crikey Moses, you know, what would it look like if I didn't use that wood conditioner? Uh, however, you just walk away and uh, over the next couple hours, it, it tones down and, the blotchiness kind of fades away and it gets a more even uh, look to it. So where I'm at right now is uh, ready to hit it with the rub-on polyurethane, uh, which I have right here. This one here is gonna have a high gloss finish on it. Uh, often I do a satin finish. This customer wants high gloss, so high gloss it'll be.
So uh, again, I'm not going to bore you with video of you know every little stroke or in this case rub with uh, one of my good T-shirts. My wife will wonder why I got a piece, big piece like this missing out of the side of my T-shirt. We won't tell her. Uh, I find them great. You know, just cut these. The T-shirt material is really good. Uh, you know, where you cut it, just go like this. Make sure you get any lint off, and uh, they're very good lint-free. Uh, rags to, to rub the poly on with. Uh, so that's what I'm going to do and then uh, when I finish the first coat I'll turn the camera back on and give you a, a peek of that. So uh, I'm going to get started. Just finished giving uh, the piano shelf its first coat of the high gloss wipe on uh, polyurethane and I have to say not very impressed. Uh, not very impressed at all. Uh, I've actually used a lot of the wipe on polyurethane and uh, I think I actually mentioned in a clip earlier that normally I do a satin finish not a high gloss finish and uh, numerous projects and different types of wood and uh, different stains I've used the satin finish over top of and I've been very happy with it. Like I say I always end up doing three or four or sometimes even a few more coats than the two that they recommend. However, uh, I've always been very happy with it. However, with this right here, first coat of the high gloss, well actually they call it a clear gloss, they don't actually call it a high gloss, they, so they call it, a, they have a matte finish, a satin, and a clear gloss, so technically the clear gloss is a high gloss. I'm not very happy with the high gloss. I mean, somebody asked me for a high gloss finish, I mean, they want shiny. This is not shiny. I mean, albeit it's the first coat, but uh, I know with the standard brush application, uh, polyurethanes and bare things, uh, on a first coat high gloss, I would be getting a lot of sparkle on this right off the bat. And uh, you can't see, but if I look in the back here, the back of that looks dull. It doesn't look uh, high gloss, that's for sure. So I'm not certain how much time I want to invest into this uh, clear gloss, uh, what do they call it? Yeah, clear gloss uh, white pop poly. Because, you know, I'm going to let this cure overnight. Uh, hit it with a very light sanding tomorrow with some 340, 320 grit rather. And, uh, and I could go at it again. But do I invest another day only to be disappointed? Because I got a funny feeling uh, this is going to disappoint me. It's just not, that should be having a much better shine than it's having right now. So I think I'm going to let this cure overnight. And then I'm going to go to my local big box store, Big Orange and uh, see what they have there in a way of a traditional brush application uh, polyurethane in high gloss because yeah this is just not cutting it. It's unfortunate but uh, hey live and learn all these years in the business and I learn something new every week at least and uh, so I'll tell you what though for the satin finish great stuff I use it all the time. The clear gloss not so much. So on that on note I'm going to call it a night disappointing night. Not happy to see this. Is what it is. We'll get it rectified tomorrow. And I'll come back and we'll let you see. You know, when I did my very first video of, of making something, I, I told myself before I even started recording anything, I thought, you know, if I'm building something and I make a mistake or something doesn't go right, I'm not going to edit that out. That, that kind of annoys me. You watch these programs on TV, you know, they're doing a multi-million dollar build and everything just goes start to finish, just falls into place. Sure it does. That's not the reality of it. Uh, you know, I'm human. This is a shop. Things happen in the shop, such as knocking over a can of stain. I actually didn't knock it over. I was staining the edge of uh, one of the shelves and I had it up on its end there. And as I was staining the top edge, the bottom edge kicked out, hit the leader of stain, big splash. You know, this is my favorite woodworking shirt too, but not the end of the world. Uh, but now, even though the camera wasn't rolling to, you know, to capture the big splash, I thought, you know, I could very well run to the house, get cleaned up, come back, turn the camera on with a big smile, acting like nothing happened. But that's not the reality of it. So I just thought I'd share that with you. So if you're having your own trials and tribulations on your piano build, don't let it get to you. It happens to everybody. And those who say it never happens are just lying to you. <laughs> so, all right, I'm here. Uh, as I spoke about, we put on the first clear glass hand rub polyurethane coat. Wasn't happy with that at all. 
I've since gone out, and uh, this is not a rub-on product. This is a brush-on product. It's a uh, Berethane uh, Gloss 900. So, yeah, Gloss 900. Now, the Gloss 900, that's uh, it's a technical term, scientific term. They're actually referring to uh, the refraction level of the finish, and uh, that's where that 900 number comes from. And that's telling me that this is going to have a good high gloss finish, and what I shouldn't be doing is shaking it like that. Whenever you have a paint on product, you don't want to shake it because uh, you can microscopic air bubbles in there that uh, when you apply it will then attract one another, grow together and form a substantial air bubble, which can then dry in your finish, hence leaving you something to deal with. So I'll probably walk away now, go have a coffee, let that calm down a bit, have my coffee, come back, I'll stir that gently from the bottom up and then apply it with a natural bristle brush, no synthetic fibers to apply this stuff. And uh, really when you're applying it, you want to dip your brush in and then wipe off your brush and, and pretty much wipe off everything that you put on your brush. And you just barely want to put any on. You don't want to just slap this stuff on thick at all. The, the least you can possibly put on with actually putting it on. That's how much you want to put on. So uh, Sometimes when you put it on you can tell it, you know, it kind of changes color. That's as much as you want to put on. And if it means putting on an extra coat or an extra four coats, the end result will be much, much better. So, uh, now, one thing I have tried, or I told myself I was going to try, believe it or not, was to try to make my videos a bit shorter. Apparently, I got a friend of mine, Dale, yeah, talking about you, buddy, uh, who busts my chops all the time because my videos says are too long. So, I guess the more I talk, the longer they're going to be, so it's a good time for me to shut up and get to work. So, I'm going to do just that, but after I get the coat on, I'll turn the camera back on and show you what it's looking like after the first application of the Gloss 900. And we'll take it from there. So I'll check in with you shortly. It's been a few days now since I've turned the camera on, so I'll give you an update. Uh, I didn't bore you with me applying five coats of the Gloss 900 Verithane product. Uh, of course, I applied that with a brush. So despite all my attempts by using a natural bristle, thick bristle brush, mm, tough to say, uh, I still have some uh, some brush lines and uh, I mean they're not that bad but they're still there and I don't want them there so uh, now comes the extra work extra uh, as opposed to what you would have to do if you were using a hand rub poly now if you recall I started off using a hand rub polyurethane uh, it was called the clear gloss I wasn't happy with it I was looking for that high gloss so uh, I moved over to the gloss 900 bare thing now again uh, I did a brush application. A couple of reasons for that. Number one, I'm not actually set up here in the shop. I'm not insured to do uh, spraying in my shop, so spraying's out of the question. But even if spraying wasn't out of the question and I could spray it, I'm not so sure I would have. And I'll tell you why. If, okay, of course, this is the back of the piano shelf, but uh, this end right here, if you recall, modern day grand pianos are actually rounded off there. This right here is the very original shape of the grand piano and uh, they didn't start rounding the ends there until like the late 30s early 40s so I'm going for a 1920s era kind of look so to spray it and have that modern day finish perfect uniform sit on top finish I'm not sure that would be very fitting to the piece uh, so I guess it's, it's only fitting that I uh, apply it by hand so it is a lot of extra work but at the end of the day, if everybody gets what they want and everybody's happy, then the work is worth it, right? So, the work. What is the work? The work is, okay, so I did five coats of these, some minimal sanding in between each coat. Uh, then I give them time to cure. Not just dry, but to cure. Uh, if you try this too soon, and you try to do some aggressive sanding too soon to this, it'll go hot, it'll gum all up, go soft and you're gonna have a mess on your hands. You, you might just wanna throw it out and start again. So you let it cure. Now one of the ways an old timer told me is to sniff it. You can come out and touch it, you know, three hours after you apply it, it's gonna be dry to the touch, and the next day you touch it, it's gonna feel the same way, so how do you know when it's actually hard? I mean, some people use a coin, start pressing coins into it to see how, you know, easily the coin will dent it, but now you're putting all these test dents in your piece. I'm not very thrilled about that idea. So an old timer told me years ago, smell it. And he said, you know, when you first apply it, you smell it, you get that really strong, 
the bare thing smell. Right now, there's no smell to that, so that's telling me it's cured. So, now that it's cured, the work begins. So I start off by hitting it with some 320 grit mesh paper. This is what's called a no-load paper, meaning it doesn't gum up, although it still does a little bit, but not quite as bad. I go from 320 to 600, from 600 to 1200, from 1200 to 1500, and from 1500 to 2000 grit over there. While I'm sanding, I'm not just sanding it bare. I have a couple of mixtures that I use here. One of the mixtures is in this bottle right here, soapy water. So, I only use that actually for the 320. Sometimes into the 600, but it's mostly just the 320. Usually when I get to the 600 and beyond, I start using my magic lotions and potions, which I'm not showing you because they're a trade secret. Uh, I mean, I could tell you, but then I'd have to hunt you all down and kill you, so think about how long that would take me. So, in the spirit of saving time, I'm not telling anybody. Uh, but yeah, I use my lotions and potions, I sand them down, and then after I sand them down with the final 2,000 grit paper, I'll put another uh, polishing agent on there, let it haze over, and then buff it until I got sweat running down my face and my arms are burning, and that's usually a sign that it's buffed enough. Right now I'm just cleaning the keys, placing them in and doing a test fit. I take a bit of uh, paste wax, furniture polish, and polish up all the black keys and the tops of the white keys just to make them look nice and shiny. And uh, so, as mentioned, I'll be doing a test fit. I dry fit them in there first, and then after I dry fit them, uh, and I'm happy with the position and the spacing, then I'll glue them in. Uh, now, in this particular one, this is actually will not. This is a custom sized uh, piano shelf, and it actually won't hold all keys. And uh, so, I actually have to take seven keys out of this uh, particular set to fit into here. Now, why seven? Uh, here's why seven. You can't just, uh, as my wife likes to say, willy nilly. You can't just pull keys out all willy nilly like. Because if you see, the keys aren't exactly straight. Right, they got that little notch in them to make way for the uh, black key, whatever that's called. I'm not musically inclined, personally. Uh, so if you just can't take one out, because the next one will be over here and you'll have a big gap beside it. So uh, uh, there's a certain number you have to take out. In fact, for the ultimate size, I wanted to take out six keys, but I, I couldn't take out six because it was going to leave me uh, with a funny one on the side, so I had to take out seven keys. So something to think about if you're going to custom size yours not to uh, hold all the keys is uh, thinking about how many keys you're going to have to take out, which keys they're going to be. So that's what I'm doing right now. And uh, like I say, a bit of paste wax, make these look nice. And then uh, simply three heavy duty beads of uh, carpenter's glue along the top and position them in and allow them to dry. That's what holds them. And uh, with three beads of carpenter's glue, you couldn't pull them off of there. So no worries about that. So I'll uh, throw it back on when I'm ready to glue them in.
fabricated upcycled piano shell. It's finished, ready to be, ready to be delivered. And uh, nice little spot here to store wine glasses. And uh, I'm certain my client will decorate this out and it'll be quite a show piece, I understand, going behind his bar. So, uh, yeah, that'll be a nice one. I hope he likes it. If you have any questions about the piano shelf or how to make it, don't hesitate, drop me a line. I'm always willing to share.